Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Designing Electrical Distribution for Water Wastewater Applications, sponsored by Schneider Electric. I'm your moderator, Gary Cohen, happy to join you today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology. Before we get started, here are some tips and tricks to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, simply refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your own computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try. But if you do need a technician, type a message in that ask a question box and the tech team will get to you as quickly as possible. Any individual user experience questions will be answered in the answered questions box. Type any question for the speaker in the ask a question box on the left-hand side of your screen. The live Q&A session will start in about 45 minutes. Today's webcast is being recorded and you will receive an email within a week with a link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the event resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. Prior to this webcast, we hope you've had a chance to register for and visit the My Schneider portal for engineers, designers, and specifiers. If you're not registered, you will need to register for the portal using the same email you use for the webcast registration to receive your PDH and CEU credits. Please register shortly after this webcast to have your attendance transferred to Schneider Electric's record keeping system for PDH and CEU credits. Portal registrants will receive an email notifying them that their completion certificate is available. Note that if you are watching this as part of a group, everyone must be registered and logged into the webcast separately so that the system recognizes you as an attendee for record keeping of completion certificates. Also note, it may take up to two weeks for the certificates to be shown in the My Schneider portal. Today's webcast is eligible for one PDH credit. You may also be eligible to receive 0.1 CEU credit. Please note, CEU credits will require a passing test score of 70% or higher to receive your certificate through the My Schneider portal. Details on taking the test are provided at the end of this webcast and provided in the exam tab at the top of the webcast player. Now we're going to hear from the sponsor of today's webcast, Schneider Electric. At the conclusion of this video, you may experience a few seconds of silence. That's just to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. Make it for green thumbs, for cooling down, for exploration, for a fresh start. But make it sustainably and protect biodiversity with our eco structure, architecture, and platform that helps preserve critical water sources. Make it more resiliently through digital transformation that adapts to changing environmental demands without compromising reliability and profitability. And make it more efficiently with scalable software solutions that maximize automation across the water cycle. Make it to manage energy thirsty processes with smart solutions that conserve access to fresh water. Make it for the new, all digital, all electric world to ensure water circularity that meets regulations and protects the resource that nourishes the industries of the future. Because whatever you're making, we'll help you make it better. So you can make it for life. Now for the fun part, I am happy to introduce today's presenter, Nicole Barthel. Nicole has 25 years in engineering systems, sales design, and strategy. She's been with Schneider Electric for 21 years in various water wastewater roles, including project management and user focus with local municipalities and water wastewater strategy for the power systems business unit. Nicole is currently in the business development, is, is currently, excuse me, the business development manager for water wastewater in the East region. 
She also tells me she's a character, so watch out, everybody. We also have David Mabius on with us today, assisting with the question and answer portion of the webcast after the main presentation. David has been with Schneider Electric for 11 years, serving in roles including Global Technical Engineering Manager, Senior Consulting Engineer, and he currently manages a regional specifier team in the West region. Thank you both for uh, joining us today. And Nicole, I'm going to hand things over to you. Excellent. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending the next hour with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to get started. So let's talk a little bit about our learning objectives for today. So we're going to talk about the subsegments for water wastewater. We're going to review typical processes in the water wastewater treatment plants and which ones are the most critical. We're also going to talk about typical architectures that you're going to see based on the size of facilities. And then we're going to touch on a few other things we need to consider when we're designing a new water wastewater project. So let's get into the subsegments. Um, most of you have heard of these, but I'm just going to start from the bottom left and move our way to the right. So we're going to talk a little bit about desalinization plants, wastewater treatment plants, water treatment plants, water and wastewater networks. And really, those include pumping stations, lift stations, and booster pump stations. We're also going to touch on um, industrial wastewater facilities because they're a little interesting, and then also the water resources. We're gonna look at the required install power. And as you can see, uh, some of these facilities are more energy intensive than others. For example, desalinization plants and wastewater treatment plants. Desalinization plants require a lot more energy to feed large pumps because of key sub-processes like seawater intake and reverse osmosis. Wastewater treatment plants also are very energy intensive, and that's because of the aeration process, which is part of the biological treatment. Networks are made of pumping stations that can range from really small for water lifting and local distribution to very large stations for water transmission over a long distance. Industrial wastewater facilities are sometimes forgotten, but they treat wastewater produced after the manufacturing process is complete. There's a lot of heavy water users out there, for example, food and beverage, paper, chemicals, petroleum refineries, and metals. Semiconductor is an industry that's fast approaching and growing in the US. And it's a little different because water is critical in the chip production. not just any kind of water, but they need ultra pure water, which is considered UPW, which is thousands of times pure, purer than drinking water. It takes roughly 1,400 to 1,600 gallons of municipal water to make only 1,000 gallons of ultra pure water with semiconductor facilities using upwards to 5 million gallons per day. So first we're gonna review a wastewater treatment plant overall process. So when facing a new water project design, it's important that we can identify the nature of the process for which is being fed. Beyond the diversity of water treatment, whether it's about drinkable water, wastewater desalinization, even for the given type, there is not a unique manner of processing. So you'll likely have to enter into each specific project to try to understand how things are being fed, why things are being fed. So the bottom line is not one size will fit all. This picture is an example of the wastewater treatment plant with the typical processes of treatment. And we'll run through a couple of those. And I'm gonna start from the bottom left and move my way to the upper right. So let's start with the preliminary treatment and that really prepares the wa water for further treatment, and it uses a lifting and mechanical cleaning process. The treatment process allows the sewage to flow through a screen, and this removes large floating objects like sticks, rags, anything that might clog the pipe or damage the process equipment. 
The primary clarification is the first step in the water treatment process by physically removing suspended solids, including oil and grease. The secondary treatment is the removal is the removal of biodegradable organic matter, and then also suspended solids through the processes of aeration and filtration. We'll also touch on disinfection, which kills harmful bacteria, and it can use three possible methods: chlorinization, ultraviolet radiation, and ozone. But I will mention that UV radiation and tablet chlorinators tend to be the most effective methods. Finally, you'll see air treatment for odor control and sludge must also be treated as well, and they use dedicated processes. I will note that you typically see uh, air treatment in larger facilities, and we'll get into that later, um, but it, it, you don't usually see them in the smaller facilities because as the process gets bigger, as the facility gets larger, the odor becomes more substantial for obvious reasons. Uh, for all of the treated uh, steps, typical loads are pumps, blowers, fans, surface aerators, mixers, centrifuge, et cetera. Um, in the next slide, we'll look at the critical process consequences of power loss. The wastewater process is critical and there can be devastating consequences if there's a loss of power to the facility. I will note here that this is a quiz question, so you may wanna take notes if you're not. Looking at the same site just discussed in the last slide, you will see that the processes in green on the screen, things like sand grit, um, the chemical feed pumps, fans, for example, if they lose power, it's a loss of production. If the processes are in yellow, they could lead to destruction of equipment. And if the processes are in red, they could lead to environmental impacts. An interruption in the wastewater treatment process may have huge consequences as all the water coming into the plant must be treated. So an interruption may cause a discharge of untreated or polluted water. And let me just tell you, this is a nightmare for the municipality because it can result in ecological impacts, risk to health, financial penalties, and it could potentially even tarnish the image and credibility of the municipality. And let me just tell you, they will definitely end up in the news or in the local paper. So water treatment is a critical process and must be designed using products and electrical architecture, which must be resilient. The site topology of the, di of a, of the different Treatment processes is important to know as it will influence the electrical architecture plus the number and the locations of the electrical rooms. Why is this? It's because of voltage mapping. Distance from utility to electrical rooms could weigh in on your decision to design either medium voltage equipment or low voltage equipment. And that is because with medium voltage systems, less copper in the form of smaller conductors and fewer sets of conductors. And as you know, copper is a large expense to the overall project. There's fewer power losses, less points of failure, lower voltage drop, and as a result, distribution of much more power capacity to the facility. Now keep in mind, if we design around medium voltage equipment, the equipment could be larger in size, and that might, might make a difference if we have um, a building that you're putting the medium voltage equipment into. Maybe doesn't make as much difference if it's being installed, say, outdoor in a NEMA 3R enclosure. Um, also, greater work distances around the equipment, and then also there could be more training required and investment in maintenance or, you might have to hire a third party company or a medium voltage electrical contractor to perform the work. Plant capacity, growing requirements of a community are observed in terms of functionality, power, process availability, safety, and energy management. Referenced architectures are a starting point for designing a real project. 
So let's walk through the different architectures based on size. Networks consists of pumping stations. And now, as I mentioned before, you'll see pumping stations, booster stations, lift stations, just to give an example. But they're categorized into three types, P1, P2, and P3. And these types are broken down by the number of pumps. So they're sized based on pumps. And we'll dive into that on the next slide. Larger facility types are listed as T1, T2, T3, and T4 with the size referenced by inhabitants or is given as PE, which stands for population equivalent, which equals equivalent polluting load of one person. The other way to size treatment plants can be referenced in a value of MGW, which stands for million gallons per day, which is relevant um, for drinking water production, including desalinization. The other way we sometimes express this is through a uh, quantity of water treated per day, which is actually noted on the slide as M3 per day. This is relevant in both drinking water and wastewater plants. We can divide the plant type into four broad categories based on daily flow and the number of inhabitants as we will review shortly. So let's talk now about um, the networks, the pumping station architectures. So typically pumping stations have a pump control panel uh, per P1 architectures that will, which is actually a small pumping station where you can control one pump or two. Sometimes you'll have a systems integrator or a, an, um, an OEM build a enclosure that has variable frequency drives, soft start controllers in them. And that could be in a 3R stainless steel outdoor enclosure, or it could be in the pump house itself. However, with larger stations, maybe in P2 or P3 architecture, you'll see that it consists of a switchboard or an ATS automatic transfer switch that feeds a motor control center that will con control multiple pumps. The motor control center can be NEMA 1 inside a building, or it can be in 3R outdoor construction to reduce the building size and reduce cost to the project. Keep in mind that you need to take into consideration where you're located in the country, of course, because of weather. There could be concerns about large um, amounts of snow, rain, and extreme temperatures, for example. So it might be better to plan on putting the equipment inside of the building. The electrical single line diagram shown on this slide would be considered a type two because it has three sewage pumps rated 100 horsepower. There is one utility feed with a fixed mounted diesel generator to provide redundancy to critical processes in case of a utility power outage. Okay, let's dive into water and wastewater treatment architectures. So this is considered a small autonomous treatment plant. Autonomous, autonomous means unmanned uh, with a typical capacity from about 1,000 to 10,000 inhabitants. So it's actually pretty small. The size of the plant could be between 25 to 125 kVA with about 16 low voltage motors and 10 instruments. The uh, architecture on the right is an example of a radial system, which is the simplest electrical distribution arrangement and the least expensive in terms of equipment cost. It's also the least reliable arrangement since it only has one single utility source. This architecture receives power from a single utility substation and steps the voltage down. The loss of utility source, transformer, or distribution equipment will result in a total loss of service. The entire process must be shut down to perform maintenance on the system. This architecture is commonly used when the need for initial um, low cost, simplicity, and space economy outweighs the need for enhanced reliability. T2 architecture. This is a medium sized treatment plant. And I use examples of different cities in Texas. And this is for Galveston, Texas, wastewater treatment plant with typical capacity from 10,000 to 100,000 PE or inhabitants. An example with power demand of one MVA, 50 low voltage motors and 100 instruments. 
typical T2 type architecture is expanded radial system. Main advantages to this architecture is that it can be expanded easily by adding additional transformers and switchboards. Also, reliability increases with the, the larger number of substations, since the loss of one transformer will not result in the loss of all the loads. It's best to design the transformers close to the center of each load group to minimize voltage drop. In this example, a generator is also included to provide emergency power to critical processes during a utility outage. And this is highly recommended as well. T3 architecture. This is for a large size city like Lubbock, for example, with typical capacity from 100,000 to 500,000 inhabitants. This is an example of a plant with about 300,000 inhabitants. The power demand is 4.5 MVA. You'll see about 200 low voltage motors and 300 instruments. This architecture is referred to as a radial feed with primary selectivity. In this example, two utility sources are available. Radial systems with primary selectivity provides almost the same economic advantages of a simple radial system with greater reliability since the failure of one utility source will not result in a total loss of service. The architecture can be designed with both open and closed transition. In this example, a generator can also be designed into the architecture to provide emergency power to the critical processes during a utility outage. Lastly, we're gonna talk about T4 architecture, and there's actually two architectures associated with this, so let's start with this first one. So this is an extra large wastewater treatment plant, typically in urban areas. An example would be Dallas, Texas. This is an example of a plant with 1.5 million inhabitants. The power demand is about 25 MVA. You'll see five medium voltage motors, 800 low voltage motors, and a, and a thousand instruments. And you heard me, but in, this, in these extra large sites, a lot of times you're going to see medium voltage designed in to the point of supporting medium voltage motors for things like blowers and maybe even um, aerators, but typically you'll see it with blowers. This example shows a radial double feed electrical architecture, which is, a sim which is simple and offers a high power availability, but is less suitable for expanding the sites. And I'll get in that into the next slide. Advantages of radial distribution systems will be voltage regulation, increased reliability, loss reduction, and avoiding congestion in cables and facilitating use of distributed generation. So this is another example of T4 architecture. And this is also for an extra large treatment plant, but this is based on what we call an open medium voltage loop design, allowing processes to be powered by another supply in the event of a malfunction, ensuring service continuity. This design is more suitable for larger utilities since it allows for the expansion of the plant more cost effectively and easily by just cutting the loop as you can see in red. And adding new loads like the new medium voltage substation I just stuck in there in red. The open medium voltage loop architecture can also be controlled by paralleling switchgear, automatic transfer scheme, using PLC or protection relays, ATSs involving a fast reconfiguration, provide load shedding of non-critical processes. It prevents us from human error and, uh, and limits downtime. However, in spite of all the strengths me mentioned, the medium voltage open loop is not as popular as radial double feed architecture shown in the last example. So this, there might be a, a question on the test. So I'll repeat myself. The medium voltage open loop is not as popular as the radial double feed architecture shown in the last example. The wastewater segment has been slow to change. 
Several medium voltage transformers are installed as close as possible to the distributed loads in order to reduce the low voltage connection distances. Maybe best to close couple the transformers to the low voltage switch gear if space is available. Looking at electrical distribution, we first need the best architecture possible. Selection of the electrical distribution equipment, such as medium voltage and low voltage switch gear, motor control centers, medium voltage and low voltage variable frequency drives, etc., and potentially services to support retrofills of existing breakers or MCC buckets, assistance with power quality studies, equipment startup, and training. On the right is an example of a T4 extra large wastewater treatment plant with typical equipment you would see at the plant. But what other factors should we design into the system after we've uh, selected the best architecture and equipment? Warning, this, this might come up on the test. We're going to touch on four other design factors. The first one being availability and reliability. The second we're gonna to touch on is power quality. Third is safety, both equipment safety and personnel safety. And lastly, visibility into the plant's critical assets. Now, let me just throw this out there that each one of these topics could be an hour long on its own. And maybe even some of the subsets of each one of these topics could be an hour long. And I'm just gonna to touch on these. But if there's something that you're interested in, um, bring that up in the questions and maybe we can do a whole presentation on just one of those topics. Availability and reliability, that's number one. There are some ways we can make sure there is availability and reliability in the electrical design. Number one, deliver secure power with backup generators to keep critical equipment running if utility power is lost. Possibly interruptible power supplies can be designed in as part of the architecture to protect against data loss. You wanna keep your medium voltage protection relays energized via a UPS or battery system. It's best to protect your PLCs, HMIs, your remote IO, and any sensitive control devices with a UPS during power loss. This gives the system some ride through time. Number two, leverage a microgrid solution. And I'm gonna get into that in the next slide. And then think about including a power monitoring system to monitor occurrences on the system, things like swells, sags, transient detection, one of the neatest things that I have seen as part of a power monitoring system is what we call direction detection. And what does that mean? In an event of a fault, the power meters and the power monitoring software sees the anomaly and indicates if it occurred outside of the facility or inside the plant. And this helps with quick troubleshooting of the fault or potentially you even reaching out to the utility to let them know that the fault occurred on their side. Next. There are challenges that, might, that municipalities face when designing a new plant. Number one, an unstable power grid. And we see issues like this specifically in California and in Texas. And there are other places across the country too. I just don't want to single them out, but it's something to consider if you're designing in California or Texas. Note that, that there's some challenges around unstable power grid. Also, power outages due to weather events. So there was an event that took place in Fort Worth, Texas uh, with winter weather storm Uri on February 15, 2021 that dumped record amounts of snow and provided low temperatures Three of their four water treatment plants had power outages, which triggered a water boil notice. How about the Category 4 hurricane, Ian, that just went through Florida back in September of 2022? The city of Lakeland in Florida has 180 pumping stations, and only 41 had backup generators. 16 million gallons of wastewater spilled due to power loss and no backup power. 
What are wastewater facilities are energy intensive? Pumping, aeration, and disinfection, which is the UV processes, are most energy intensive and very critical processes. They're not only energy intensive, but very critical. Desalinization plants are even more energy intensive due to the reverse osmosis process. This is because a high pressure pump is required to push seawater through filters with tiny little holes to remove the salt from the water. The reverse osmosis process happens in two stages, which, which requires not one, but two high pressure pumps. Due to the challenges described, we should look for opportunities to design a microgrid solution. So as I move forward, there could be a quiz question in here. So what is a microgrid? It's a collection of assets, could be solar, battery storage, generators, et cetera, with a microgrid controller. And that's the key right there, a microgrid controller. The microgrid system can island the facility from the utility and will use the on-site power assets to provide energy resiliency, reliability, energy cost management, and sustainability. Biggest difference between microgrids and just a backup generator is that the microgrid can sell services back to the utility. One of the best benefits of a microgrid solution for a customer, customer like a municipality that is part of a large and stable power grid, that's the key, part of a large and stable power grid, would be to reduce their energy price with self-consumption of renewable energy, including waste to resource solution. And what do I mean by waste to resource solution? An example would be to power a biogenerator with methane that would typically be burned off in the atmosphere. Let's move on to number two, which is power quality. We need to look for opportunities to design in power quality equipment, like power factor correction capacitor, whether it's medium voltage or low voltage, and harmonic mitigation. So let's talk about the power factor in relation to a cappuccino. So reactive power, which is the KVAR, which I call the froth, is the power that hasn't been converted into KVA. Reactive power is the unused power generated by reactive components. The, the real power, the KW, which is the coffee part, is the power consumed due to the resistive load. This is what the utility actually writes on the invoice. The apparent power is the entire cup. It's the power the grid must be able to withstand, and it's also the same power that we use to size our equipment. Power factor quantifies how much of the energy flowing in the load is being consumed. The rest gets returned back to the utility. And since the utility only charges for the energy con, uh, consumed, the real power, they don't want low power factor. A low power factor means that the load returns, to, uh, returns a good part of the energy that flows through it. Many utilities impose penalties for low power factor because it's like returning power back to them and it adds operational cost. Power factor is given as a percentage or zero to plus minus one range. Water wastewater plant electrical load profile is very different from most industries in that two or three of the major loads consume the majority of the electrical power. The rest of the electrical system has small effect on the electrical consumption. And I'll give you an example. Six 500 horsepower medium voltage aeration blowers in a wastewater treatment plant ammonia removal process. All the other loads in that project are gonna be small, maybe feeding lighting loads, vents, unit heaters, et cetera. Typical symptoms of power quality issue include what you'll see on the slide, lights flickering, transformers overheating, false tripping of circuit breakers, lighting ballast failures, power supply failures, computers and PLC malfunctions, et cetera. Take into account the designing and reliability such as UPS or generators tend to magnify the effects of the power quality issues and, could, and must be evaluated. 
So I'm going to list out a couple solutions that could solve power factor concerns. They include untuned or fixed capacitor banks. It's kind of like a battery. There are capacitors that are designed to store electrical energy in the form of an electric field. This is a cost-effective option to improve power factor. Because the untuned capacitor is fixed, it can overcompensate often in the case of a power failure. The power returns and most of the large loads stay turned off. It's recommended to use a fixed capacitor with contactors that will automatically disconnect the bank during a power failure. You could also provide tuned or variable capacitor banks. Capacitor banks with adjustable capacitance with tuning inductors that reduce the switching noise from the contactor to reduce harmonics. Compensation comes in a stepped approach, which can offer a low precision. Next, we're going to talk about harmonics. Harmonics are distortion on the electrical current and mostly are produced by nonlinear loads such as pump and motor variable frequency drives. Also, ozone generator power supply units and ultraviolet, ultraviolet uh, filtration equipment. Say that five times fast. Um, and this is considered uh, electrical pollution. You'll have people that'll mention it that way. So harmonics makes a clean current waveform as shown in the graph from a motor that draws low harmonics look dirty as shown kind of in the teeth graph below it. The stepping current does not flow smoothly through the wiring and equipment. Symptoms of high level harmonics include overheating of motors, drives and cables, as well as thermal tripping of protective devices and experiencing logic faults of digital devices. All the problems can cause disruption in loads, which re result in downtime. The lifespan of equipment can also be reduced because of overheating resulting in uh, reduced electrical equipment reliability. Water wastewater facilities are filled with electric loads just described, and that's why harmonic filtering is recommended during the design of the project. And of course, there are several solutions to address harmonics at a municipality, and I'm going to go through some of those. Uh, so 3% and 5% line chokes or line reactors, best used to reduce harmonics and line notching caused by motors controlled by drives. One choke needs to be provided per drive, Harmonics are reduced by approximately 50% 50, 50 of the expense of the reduced power factor. Another option would be passive harmonic filters. This option is commonly used on the input side of the motor drive system, kind of like a line reactor. It too mitigates the amount of harmonic distortion produced by variable frequency drives. The disadvantage is that they can be affected by the external harmonics on mains and can potentially overheat. It's also hard to properly size the filters because the external harmonics are difficult to identify and there is no one size fits all device. Active harmonic filters is also another option and this corrects both power factor and reduces harmonics. So you get a two for one deal. The active harmonic filter measures the harmonic content in the power factor load or plant feeder and calculates the correction current. The harmonic filter injects correction current into the line to cancel out the harmonic currents and improve power factor. This is a great solution when combined with multiple six pulse drives with line reactors. This product can be standalone or provided in motor control centers. The last one I'm gonna to touch on is active front end drives. It's a low harmonic drive using electronics, not a phase shifting transformer to reduce the harmonics to the system. This is a great solution for those larger low voltage drives such as aerators, blowers, raw sewage pumps, about 200 horsepower and above. Take into consideration that during the design, there needs to be a level of flexibility when providing power quality equipment. There could be the need 
to provide multiple solutions per project to meet the desired outcome for the municipality. And you'll hear me say this a lot, that not one size fits all. Let's move on to safety. This is a good topic here. We need to provide safety features into the equipment design to protect the equipment. We need to look for opportunities to provide arc flash mitigation options, such as arc resistant equipment, arc flash detection, utilizing protection relays and sensors, energy reduction maintenance switches, and maybe even zone selective interlocking. We also need to design ways to remove the site personnel out of harm's way if there, God forbid, be an event. So let's talk about arc flash mitigation. And I have four topics here that I'm gonna dive into. We're gonna go through some of the arc flash mitigation solutions. So let's start with number one, which is arc resistant equipment design, which we call a passive design. It redirects the arc energy up and out of the equipment through ducts and vents overhead or outside and away. The pressure of the arc opens a vent flap in the top of the gear, redirecting the heated gas and arc up and away from the operators and maintenance personnel. Arc flash incident energy is controlled if there are no physical compromise of the enclosure, which means everything needs to be closed and um, screwed down properly. And of course, proper PPE must be worn. A passive arc resistant switch gear does not protect the equipment. The interior of the switch gear is subject to destructive forces of the arc blast and the heat rise event. In almost every case, the equipment must need to be replaced after an event. The incident energy is not lowered with this method because it relies on a standard circuit protection method to trip the upstream breaker and extinguish the arc. Lastly, this design requires the addition of plentums to provide a way to move the arc energy out of the electrical room. More space might be required. Ceiling height may need to be taken into consideration. And also it can be a costly equipment design and have a long lead time. Number two, we'll talk about arc block 1200 and 2500. So the arc block technology is a unique low voltage passive protection system that contains a line side arc flash event. Arc block helps prevent arc flash causes from originating and contain the arc energy if it were to occur. It's great for pumping station applications where the MCC or switchboard is fed directly from the utility. Cables, and equipment are not damaged after an arc flash event. The main breaker doesn't even trip. Arc block comes with a UL verified arc flash label. It's available with new equipment or it can be field installed on existing equipment by field services. There's no special relays to program, no commissioning or testing required. The main breaker comes with something I'm gonna talk about here in the future, but what we call continuous thermal monitoring. And lastly, arc block is recognized in NFPA 70E, significant changes annex 0.2.3. This offer includes 1200 amp to 2500 amp fixed mounted main breaker in low voltage motor control center in QED2 construction switchboard construction available in NEMA 1, 1A enclosure type, and even in some NEMA 12 enclosures as well. A short circuit coordination and arc flash study is still recommended to conduct um, the AIC rating of the load side of the main breaker, but that could be addressed with um, some energy reduction maintenance switches, for example. Let's touch on number three, which is arc detection design methods, where we attempt to detect uh, arc flash events and signal the breaker tripping faster than a normal circuit protection method would. This can be done a variety of ways, including zone selective interlocking, 
bus differential relay protection, arc flash reduction maintenance switches, and arc flash mitigating relays. So let's talk about um, arc flash mitigating relays. So this me method doesn't rely on the upstream main breaker to extinguish the arc. The protection relay with sensors can detect the ex and extinguish the arc in less than four milliseconds. The arc detection system needs to be designed to make sure that the fiber optic sensors are installed in the correct zones. The sensors need to be installed in the field after the equipment has been delivered to the site and the protection relays need to be programmed with the proper settings and tested in the field. Let's touch, touch on number four, which is the medium voltage shielded solid insulation system. 2SIS, say that five times fast, switch gear. It reduces the opportunity of arc flash or um, contact with live parts because all the current carrying components are in high dielectric insulating epoxy. So everything, the bus bar, all the connection points are all in this high dielectric insulating epoxy. So even if you were to lay a screwdriver between phases, the bus would never see that. I wouldn't recommend you doing that, but that's just an example. Um, it comes standard from our factory. It is no extra charge. There is no extra hardware or programming required. Uh, longer time between maintenance intervals, it, it's about 10 years because of all the current carrying components being in that epoxy. There is improved performance in harsh environments such as water wastewater facilities and demanding environments compared to, say, the traditional switchgear. The ground shielded system doesn't allow the main breaker to be exposed to the free air, which minimize risks to internal arcing, reduced maintenance, and reduced risk of downtime. It is available in 600 and 1200 amp applications. The switchgear and the breakers both are rated 25 KAIC available fault current, and the enclosure and constructions include NEMA 1 and 3R. Safety around re removing workers from the hazard. So here are a few solutions. Um, here's another four solutions that I'm gonna touch on. So let's start with number one, um, or actually in this case, number five, closed door racking or remote racking. Um, this solution is designed to allow an operator or maintenance personnel to disengage a low voltage or medium voltage circuit breaker, or even a low voltage motor control center bucket remotely from the energized power bus before opening the equipment door. The low voltage and medium voltage breakers will have a connected test and disconnected position. And the low voltage motor control center will just be either connected or disconnected position only. And in the case of a low voltage motor control center, the line side breaker stab assembly actually racks away from the vertical bus so the bucket can be removed while it's de-energized. Number two or six is the absence of voltage tester, the AVT. It it's reimagines the absence of voltage testing process. It looks for ways to remove risk, reduce exposure, and eliminate the most common failure modes and errors that occur, occur when using a portable uh, handheld test set or, equip, or instrument. It keeps hazardous voltage off the door and it automatically self calibrates. It's UL and NFPA 70E recognized and certified. It's available in indoor and outdoor applications up to a thousand volts service entrance. Number seven, remote control operation. Open and close allows the operator to open and close circuit breakers from a safe distance using a remote switch actu actuator. This can also be provided in a remote control cabinet where you have an HMI screen either somewhere else in the room, away from the equipment, or outside of the room so that you're away from any of those incidences that could um, occur if, when you're opening and closing the breaker. Uh, we personally recommend providing an HMI to perform the operation, and this allows flexibility when adding additional breakers in the future. 
Using the HMI remote operation panel can also be used to monitor break, breaker tripping and information that's being monitored by a power monitoring system. And lastly, number eight, IR windows or infrared viewing windows provide visibility to critical connection points inside the electrical distribution equipment that can be recorded using a thermal camera. If windows are not provided, then covers must be removed. The, the technician or testing uh, company needs to wear proper PPE and use a thermal camera to check critical connection points while the equipment is energized. The IR window option can be conducted without having to open or remove panel covers, thereby saving time and money and improving safety to our, our personnel. There is another solution, and that is called continuous thermal monitoring. What if there's a loose connection the week after the IR scan? You won't know about the loose connection until there's a failure or maybe a year later when the next IR scan is done. It would be best to design in continuous thermal monitoring on the critical assets, basically on the bus and the terminal connections for 24-7 monitoring, providing historical data that can be evaluated to determine next steps. With this option, you wouldn't need IR windows or scans. In over five sections of switchgear, the cost between IR windows and continuous thermal monitoring is the same. Next, let's talk about visibility into critical assets. We discovered early in this presentation that there can be devastating consequences if there is a loss of power to specific processes like lifting pumps, rainwater pumps, digesters, etc. If the processes stop operating, this could lead to an environmental impact. What if we design the electrical distribution feeding these critical processes with that same 24-7 monitoring. This includes continuous real-time monitoring with immediate alarming. Is continuous thermal monitoring a part of this solution? The answer is yes, but there's more. Here's an example of problems electrical distribution equipment faces once it's installed like corrosion, loose cables, or bus bar connections. Breaker connections and condensation can cause premature aging. I'm sure some of you heard about the city of Houston East Water Plant power outage. If not, here's what happened. November 2022, there were two utility feeds at the East Water Plant. Without warning, one transformer failed and the system automatically transferred to the other transformer, which also failed. In this case, the utility um, didn't fail. It was the transformers that failed. The site did have a backup generator. However, the backup generator was installed ahead of the two transformers on the line side, and it couldn't restore the power back to the site. In Texas, if you drop below 20 PSI, you go into a boil water notice until power is restored and the water can be tested. What if the city of Houston East water plant had dissolved gas analyzers? the protection relays being monitored 24 seven. So here I just wanna explain that we have lots of connected products. We have devices that are already being designed into the system that have connectivity via Modbus TCP IP or some other way of, of connecting those devices together. What if we take those devices, add some thermal monitoring to it, and then connect it to an existing edge control layer, something like a power monitoring expert system or a SCADA system or ecostructure process expert, some kind of distributed control system like a DCS? What if we connected all those devices together to give you more visibility into the system? And this is also gonna be on the quiz as well. But just to kind of recap on this, visibility into critical assets benefits the municip municipality by transforming data into action, prevent unplanned failure by early detection, and reduced downtime risk because of the condition-based assets. So we, this is just kind of a recap, and we're going to open it up to questions here in a minute. But just a reminder that to get the continuing education, 
certificate. You have to download the presentation. There's all the links here to take the test. Um, I think we're going to put that into the chat. So you have a link to that and then you'll get your certificate. Information about the portal. And we appreciate all your time today. All right. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, now, Nicole and Dave will answer a few questions from the audience. If you have questions, just type those uh, into the ask a question box on your screen. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. We're going to have a lot of time left. But any questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www.csemag.com. And remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation. Use the event resources tab uh, on the left-hand side of your screen. To achieve PDH credit, those instructions are also outlined in the PDF version of the presentation and in the exam tab at the top of the webcast player. All right. Uh, if you guys are ready, let's see if we can get a few questions in here. Uh, let's start with, is the ArcBlock 1200 and 2500 a reusable device, or is it a blown and done type of device? When will the ArcBlock 3200 become available? So I know that we've tested it quite a few times on the, the same uh, lineup before, but we are claiming in our literature that it can be used five times before it would need to be replaced. So it's not a one and done. It can continue to be used. Got it. Uh, what is uh, the minimum intervals of reperforming arc flash calculations for CNI plants per OSHA requirements? David, I'm going to need you for that one. <laughs> I can clearly help with that. So the, the OSHA, NFP 70E is part of how OSHA evaluates this. And there's a, a guidance and a guideline uh, of five years. So the review is not required, but is recommended not to exceed five years. And especially if there's any major changes to your power system or um, you're going to do an expansion in your particular system. So it's a, it's a really great question um, for that one. Got it. Uh, this should be an easy one, or not an easy one, but a quick one. Special electrical qualifications are required when working on equipment with voltage greater than 460 volts, correct? Correct. <laughs> Again, we're going we're gonna to point to the NFPA 70E, and what they're going to talk about is worker safety. The owner, either the municipality or whoever owns the company, is responsible to provide the training for the person working on it. They're supposed to be trained and qualified and understand the construction of the equipment that they're going to work on. And they're all supposed to have the documentation and single lines to be able to perform that task safely. Got it. Uh, on major upgrades to older treatment plants, when do you... Uh, decide to remove and replace equipment that will fall, that will fail, sorry, in say five years. Say the plant needs to double in size, volume of flows. I mean, for me, it depends on how, um, how old and obsolete is the equipment. Can you still provide components, say buckets or retrofit breakers? But another thing to keep in mind too is uh, how, 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 what, what is the state of the equipment? Um, is it rusted? Is, is the bus tarnished? Um, is there, they're pitting on the bus? Some of that may need to be evaluated during an outage to determine whether it just needs to be replaced or whether it just can be modified in the field. If we're start to, if we're getting into expanding, uh, like doubling the size, it might make sense to look at what options, how old is the equipment and, and does it make sense to expand it and then go back in the next five years or so and then replace the, the equipment that hasn't been replaced yet? Got it. This is probably the last one we have time for. It'll have to be a relatively quick one. So if this isn't a quick answer, just let me know. Uh, what studies would be recommended for WWTPs during design and during operations? I mean, David, you can respond to this, but I mean, definitely short circuit coordination and arc flash study, um, power quality would be an, another study we would recommend around harmonics specifically because of all the variable frequency drives associated with the motors and pumps. Um, there's going to be studies on room layout, how, how, what are the distances between walls, will the equipment fit? These are all things that we would, we would definitely recommend. Absolutely. 
Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for all the great questions. And thank you so much again to our speakers, Nicole Barthel and David Mabius, for sharing your time and expertise. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you for having us. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, Schneider Electric, for sponsoring today's event. Uh, now that we are just about done, we do want to hear how we did. An exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve these webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology, I'd like to thank you for attending. This is the end of the webcast. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day.